people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India is set to roll out fourth vaccine in the country after Indian drug maker company Sipla got regulatory approval to distribute Moderna's vaccine. India inoculated around 357 million doses by Friday. The majority of the vaccines given in India are by locally manufactured Oxford AstraZeneca's Covishield and indigenously developed Covaxin. Russia's Sputnik V has been the latest entry and is set to produce hundreds of millions by the end of the year. After Covishield, Covaxin and Sputnik V, India is ready to receive its fourth vaccine. America's biotech company Moderna vaccine that was one amongst the two used by the states to inoculate its citizens will be a part of India's massive vaccination campaign too. The Moderna vaccine has shown efficacy of approximately 94.1% in protecting against COVID-19. WHO says the immunity starts to develop after 14 days of the first dose. Indian drug maker Sipla Limited has received regulatory approval to distribute it, paving the way for import in coming days. New drug permission has been granted to Moderna. This is the first internationally developed vaccine for which now such permission exists today. And as I said, this new drug permission for restricted use, which is the other name for emergency use authorization, is now in operation. And uh, this, this potentially opens up a clear possibility, clear likelihood of this vaccine being imported into India. In a major ramp-up to the vaccination drive, India, which has so far administered around 357 million doses of different vaccines, administered 61 million doses in the last two weeks. It was more than the number of people who signed up for shots during the period, indicating an improvement in supplies after widespread shortages. The government has been working to enhance the capacity of manufacturing and is also planning to import others to meet its objective of vaccinating all adults by the end of the year. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, while appreciating the efforts of the doctors on National Doctors' Day, announced a credit guarantee scheme of $6.7 billion to strengthen the health infrastructure of the country. Abham. ऐसे क्षेत्रों में हेल्थ इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर को मजबूत करने के लिए पचास हजार करोड़ रुपए की एक क्रेडिट गारंटी स्कीम लेकर आए हैं जहां स्वास्थ्य सुविधाओं की कमी है India is treading carefully after the massive jolt it received in the second wave when thousands of them succumbed to the virus. And in a collective breakthrough, the country's caseload has come down to half a million from 3.5 million peak in mid-May. While some regions of the northern India where the positivity rate has dropped under 1%, the restrictions have been eased. Others like Maharashtra and Kerala with little higher positivity rates are keeping the controls tighter. Tourism industry, which received a huge hit due to the pandemic, is slowly opening too, with the government allowing travellers and revellers to visit places under a strict COVID-compliant protocol. Moving on. Balots have intensified their anti-PAC movement as they are now holding rallies across the major global cities against state-backed enforced disappearances in the region. And now, with COVID restrictions easing all around, they have pledged to escalate it further. Balots accuse that a PAC army-backed campaign has abducted and killed thousands of them in recent times for rightfully demanding independence from Pakistan, which had forcibly annexed the mineral-rich province in 1948. 
anti Pakistan Baloch campaign is gathering traction and momentum as more people are joining in, taking to streets and demanding accountability into state sponsored human rights violations. After London last week, a number of them gathered and demonstrated in different European cities against forceful disappearances by Pakistan. Unconditional release of political prisoners, including Dr. Deen Mohammed Baloch, who remains missing even after 12 years of his abduction, were the prime demands. Baloch leaders, most of whom are living in exile, say their prime motivation behind carrying out their events in the European and American countries is that their plights, which are not any lesser grave than other humanitarian crises across the world, have not yet found enough international attention and support. So there are thousands of Baloch students, doctors, lawyers who are still missing in Pakistani secret torture cells. But the problem is that the international community is silent and Pakistani establishment, Pakistani intelligence agencies, Pakistani ISI, Pakistani MI are enjoying the impunity and the silence uh, by the international community. In a bid to get a better shot at their objective, a similar protest was held in the UN city of Geneva where the Human Rights Council is located. As per data collated by different groups and organizations including UNPO, Unrepresented Nations and People's Organization and the Voice for Baloch Missing Persons, the Baloch disappearance issue is not a trivial political issue but a grave humanitarian crisis. Anyone who is deemed resistant to Pakistan's nefarious designs in the region is picked. Subsequently, he is either imprisoned incommunicado or killed with impunity. Today, the region finds itself at the lowest in all performing indicators. Despite having the vast minerals and resources, the GDP of Balochistan is always hovering at the bottom. Pakistan has been plundering this region of its vast mineral and gas reserves for decades. But when people demanded freedom or even autonomy or in some cases even a share, it resulted in the systematic annihilation. Forces are take, taking the people uh, and then there's a no whereabout of those people. Neither they are presented to any court of justice nor their even family members. They do not know or that, or where are they and to, uh, what they have done for what they have been uh, and disappeared by force. And this is an activity which the Pakistani forces have been doing it for many years. Activists also say that there has been a sharp rise in human rights violations in Balochistan since the launch of the multi-billion China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPEC. They say it has brought only death and destruction, contrary to the promises of economic opportunities, employment and prosperity. CPEC is a network of roads, railways and energy projects linking China's Xinjiang to Balochistan's Gwadar port. They accuse Pakistani security forces have been given a free hand to eliminate voices against the illegal project. The Chinese government has spent nearly $70 billion on the project and experts say there are no chances it is reconsidering its ambitions. So it is only the Baloch plight that is going to extend if international powers do not come to their rescue. Moving on, the specter of Taliban looms large over Afghanistan with foreign troops drawdown getting underway. And what could be called a spot-on forecast by experts, Taliban are making major headways with dozens of districts already under their control. The Afghan authorities are in a state of nerves with no real blueprint on the table. And while Washington has said that withdrawal does not mean abandoning Afghanistan, Kabul finds itself pressed to the wall. And amidst all this, former Mujahideen and civilians have vowed to fight the Taliban. Parwan province in Afghanistan is now seeing some new armed fighters in its mountains. And they are not insurgents nor any other terrorist group splinter, but former Mujahideens and civilians who have vowed to fight against the Taliban. 
They have picked up arms to save their country and they will not let the Taliban advance even after the foreign forces leave. Among them, 55-year-old Dost Muhammad Salangi, who was also a Mujahideen, is leading an army of dozens in Ghorband. در زمان قوات های شوروی صاحب کمرای احمد شاه مسعود قاضی در جبهه و جنگ تربیه شدیم و آموزش و پرورش دیدیم تا انوز ما در صفوف دولت هم هستیم بودیم و حتی بچه های ما در صفوف دولت قرار دارد Since the United States announced plans in April to withdraw its troops without conditions by September 11 after nearly 20 years of conflict Violence has escalated throughout the country as the Islamist Taliban seeks more territory. It has worsened, especially in the north, where Taliban insurgents have conducted a wave of offensive in recent days, moving beyond their southern strongholds. Intense fighting in the northern Afghan province of Kunduz killed at least 28 civilians. According to hospital officials, it injured 290 this week. Security convoys have patrolled the area in an attempt to keep residents safe from Taliban attacks. We are not going to be able to kill any of our brothers. But if the people of the war are killed, if the people of the war are killed, if the people of the war are killed, like they are killed in the war, or the people of the war, or the people of the war, or the people of the war, if the Taliban will come back to this system, we will not be able to kill any of the people of the war, or the people of the war, or the people of the war. Why? Because they do not have the law of Islam and the law of human rights. They do not have the law of the war. They do not have the law of the war. Though there have been meetings in the recent days and the Taliban say they are committed to negotiations, peace talks in Doha have largely remained stalled. Afghan President Ashraf Ghani with his former rival and top Afghan peace official Abdullah Abdullah have met U.S. President Joe Biden to discuss the U.S. troop withdrawal, but nothing seems to be working out as of now. The United Nations envoy for Afghanistan said this week the Taliban had taken more than 50 of 370 districts and was positioned to control provincial capitals as the country looked increasingly unstable. Chairman of the High Council for National Reconciliation, Abdullah Abdullah, said the country's survival was in danger now. Salamat Afghanistan. Wahdatu yak parchagi Afghanistan. Yemi Afghanistan, enemy masala ba khatar mojish. Khob, bazam tekrar mekonim ki dari ki rahe betar as sol hujud nadara. Wakti ki khodawan harfa takmil kerda ki wa sol ho khair. Masala khat nis. While Afghanistan has witnessed protracted war for two decades, observers say it finds itself at the most crucial juncture today. If Taliban recaptures what it had until 2001, before it was ousted by US-backed forces, then not only will the trillions of dollars be deemed wasted, but a return of hardline Islamic Sharia law will plunge the country into a constant cycle of chaos and instability thereby paving way for another humanitarian crisis the world cannot afford to have. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that hit the headlines this week. Hong Kong's active chief executive has claimed that the city has returned to order from chaos since China imposed a sweeping national security law on the global financial hub last year. The statement came after a flag-raising ceremony to celebrate the anniversary of the city's handover to China. Beijing imposed the security law just before the midnight on June 30 last year to punish anything China deems as subversion, secession, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces with up to life in prison. It also included reduction in democratic representation in the city's legislature and various screening mechanisms for politicians. Major streets and parks where July 1 protests against the same law were scheduled were barricaded and cordoned off. People, however, came out in large number and demanded the restoration of the autonomy Hong Kong has had over the years.
Soybean is a versatile food and one of the central ingredients of Japanese cuisine. It constitutes the basis of many distinctive Japanese flavors such as soy sauce, miso and tofu. Soybean is also processed into countless Japanese culinary products. This factory in Saitama, north of Tokyo, still uses the traditional method of making soy sauce that was inherited 220 years ago by Fueki family. It aims to preserve the flavor and quality of their soy sauce through special fermentation process. えっと、お醤油の原料は、え、伝統的な醸造方法では3つです。まず1つは大豆。で、2つ目が小麦。で、3つ目がお塩になってます。不液醤油は江戸時代から変わらない伝統的な醸造方法を守って、で、もろみを
Indian culture is not just about gaiety and fanfare, but it is also about preserving the heritage and legends that have shaped it. Sikhism, one of the modern religions, is full of such epics. Today we take you to the holy city of Amritsar, where Sikh devotees gathered in large numbers to pay obeisance and mark the birth of sixth Sikh Guru, Hargobind Singh. A pool of Sikh devout visited the holy shrine of Sikhism Golden Temple in India's Amritsar city to mark the auspicious occasion of Prakash Parv, the birth anniversary of the Sikh spiritual leader Guru Hargobind. On this auspicious occasion, the Gurudwara was lit up with colorful lights and its skyline was illuminated with fireworks. The devotees thronged the holy shrine lit oil lamps and performed special prayers while recollecting the teachings of Guru. It is believed that Guru Hargobin played a key role in providing a new direction in religion of Sikhism. Guru Maharaj is a man who 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 is a Born in late 16th century at Guru Ki Vadali near Amritsar, Guru Hargobind was the only son of the fifth Guru Arjan Dev, who was killed by Mughal Emperor Jahangir. Guru Hargobind propagated the idea of learning Gatka, a form of martial arts and weaponry, to fight operation. The practitioners of Gatka also emphasized that this form should never be misused. Guru Hargobind was the first Sikh Guru to engage in war and fought against the tyranny of Mughal Empire. He also created the Akal Takht or seat of power at the Golden Temple. The number of devotees was relatively low due to the pandemic. However, the religious spirit was as high as ever. Despite having taught the community to resist and retaliate any aggression, Guru Hargobind's teachings essence have been peace and harmony. Devotees believe his teachings are the source of inspiration for all and his principles of humanity, secularism and universal brotherhood would continue to guide the humankind on the path of righteousness. Each Sikh Guru has enriched the religion with different set of values that devotees abide by in their entire lives. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.